Tonight at 10, in a surprise move, the world's biggest economies, China and the US, agree a joint approach to climate change. They'll work together on key areas such as cutting methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, promoting clean energy, as well as emissions from industry and transport. The United States and China have no shortage of differences, but on climate, on climate, cooperation is the only way to get this job done. Earlier in the day, Boris Johnson, the summit host, had appealed for a determined push to make progress in the closing days. We'll be asking what the China-US deal means for the overall outcome of the summit. Also tonight, Sir Geoffrey Cox, the Conservative MP, denies any wrongdoing by using his parliamentary office to do outside work. As migrants in Belarus continue to suffer as they try to enter Poland, Russia is accused of manipulating the situation for its own ends and a report on the wartime sinking of HMS Dasha and the families still looking for answers today. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News Channel, England are out of the men's T20 World Cup after New Zealand won their semi-final by five wickets in Abu Dhabi. Good evening. Delegates at the Climate Summit in Glasgow were taken by surprise tonight when China and the US issued a joint statement agreeing to improve cooperation over the next decade. John Kerry, the US climate envoy, said that the US and China had no shortage of differences, but on climate, cooperation, he said, was the only way to get the job done. There were joint steps agreed on a range of issues, including methane emissions, the transition to clean energy and decarbonisation. The climate summit is now in its final few days. Dozens of countries have promised to phase out petrol and diesel-powered cars, but on that, the US and China did not sign up. Our science editor, David Chukman, has the latest. Can the world agree to slow down the release of the gases heating the planet? Can it do what it takes to reduce the melting of the polar ice? And will this be enough to limit the rise of the sea? With the conference now entering its final days, delegates are trying to find common ground. And the UK, as host, has come up with a draft of a possible agreement. Seven pages of text, welcomed as a first step by some, but criticised by many. The words are almost uh, meek and mild in many places. And I think, you know, the world is on fire. I mean, we've seen the Australian wildfires. We've seen, you know, koalas being burnt alive. We need to make sure that we've got power and proactive commitments on the table. Any document like this is bound to be a compromise. So it calls for the first time for coal to be phased out, the dirtiest fossil fuel, but doesn't give a date. It pushes for one and a half degrees Celsius to be the limit of global warming, but currently no one's on course to achieve that. And it urges countries to update their climate plans, not in 2025, but far sooner, in fact, next year. But there's no obligation. It needs to be really clear there's no room for ambiguities and fudges. Uh, I see in this latest text there's a lot of um, urging and calling for that kind of, uh, of soft language, and it'll need to be sharpened up Otherwise, it will be very difficult to claim that this summit has, um, uh, has succeeded. So the Prime Minister has stepped in, briefly, but faced with an uphill struggle, he's now trying to manage expectations. The COP26 summit here in Glasgow is not going to fix it in one go. We're not going to arrest climate change uh, right here, right now. That is just impossible. Uh, and, and I think everybody has got to be realistic about that. But there is the possibility that we will come away from this with the first genuine roadmap for a, a solution to anthropogenic climate change. And that possibility was given a boost when China's top negotiator made a surprise announcement of a joint climate plan with the United States. The world's two biggest polluters agreed to reduce methane a highly potent greenhouse gas, a positive signal of cooperation. The United States and China have no shortage of differences, but on climate, on climate, 
Cooperation is the only way to get this job done. We'll soon see what that adds up to in this last phase of the talks where China is among industrial giants worried about breaks on its development. And others like Madagascar, victims of climate change, are desperate for this conference to get them help. Well, let's talk a little more then about that surprise announcement by China and the US. And uh, David, our science editor, David Chuckman, is in Glasgow. Um, what's the likely impact of this statement, David, on the outcome, do you think? Well, it's worth bearing in mind that if you add together the carbon emissions of America and China, you get to pretty well half the global total. So when the two of these giants act together, it does tend to make a difference. It certainly did six years ago when the Paris Agreement uh, was ushered in. But, and there is a big but here, we are now in the end game at these talks. We're in the diplomatic trench warfare where there are line by line arguments over what's going to be in the final agreement. We don't yet know whether the big coal producing countries will object to the idea that's in that agreement of phasing out coal. We definitely know that the poorest nations feel extremely disappointed that more isn't being made of the fact that they were promised aid 12 years ago and it still hasn't been delivered. And overarching everything is still the fundamental question about whether we can bridge the gap between what the science says is needed, which is basically halve global emissions in the next nine years to avoid the worst of global warming, and what's actually happening in the real world, which is emissions are still rising. So there's everything to play for. The next 48 hours are really crucial. David, many thanks once again for the latest there at the COP26 summit in Glasgow. David Chuckman. The Prime Minister says that MPs who don't abide by parliamentary rules should be investigated and possibly punished, but he defended the principle of politicians having second jobs and said he didn't believe that the United Kingdom was fundamentally uh, a uh, corrupt country. The Conservative MP and former Minister, uh, Sir Geoffrey Cox, has denied breaching rules on MPs' behaviour after he was filmed apparently using his parliamentary office to carry out paid work advising the government of the British Virgin Islands. Our political editor Laura Kunzberg has more details. Not always pretty from the outside, nor perhaps on the inside either. Here's a former cabinet minister working as a lawyer from what seems to be his Commons office. Forgive my absence during some of the morning, I'm afraid. Yes, thank the you very much. The bell went off, he says. In other words, he had to leave this lucrative session to go and vote. And here he was again, working in the Caribbean while travel restrictions were tight. There are real drawbacks to open registers. It becomes a political tool. Pondering that while declaring outside work was the right thing, it could cause some problems. <laughs> MPs are allowed to do other jobs. But Sir Geoffrey, the booming Brexiteer, has been the top outside earner in the Commons and using premises funded by the taxpayer for other work is not allowed. After a couple of days of silence, a statement appeared on Sir Geoffrey's website saying he's a leading barrister in England and makes no secret of his professional activities. He always ensures his casework on behalf of his constituents is given primary importance and fully carried out but that Sir Geoffrey will cooperate fully with an investigation into what happened, even though he does not believe that he breached the rules. Prime Minister, are you running away from the sleeves allegations? Boris Johnson might have boarded an early train to Glasgow, but 400 miles didn't give him much political distance. Should MPs have second jobs, Prime Minister? There are plenty in his own party, as well as the odd person greeting him in Glasgow, deeply unimpressed. <laughs> But press for answers at the climate conference, he wouldn't say sorry for how he's handled MPs with second jobs. Those who break the rules must be investigated and should be punished. I genuinely believe that uh, the UK is not remotely a uh, corrupt uh, country, nor do I believe that our institutions are, are corrupt. Labour won't let up because it thinks the Prime Minister is vulnerable. Although, as an MP, before he became leader, Keir Starmer earned more than £100,000 part-time doing legal work. This is going back several years. I actually gave up my um, certificate to practice law the best part of two years ago. I'm not particularly bothered by what the um, mail or others are trying to rake up. But I would just say this, that anything I've done um, since I've been in Parliament 
um, has been in accordance with the rules and properly declared. There are many different strands and claims of sleaze, that toxic mixture of money and politics that creates such suspicion. It's the behaviour of a few dozen, mainly Conservative MPs, that's being called into question. But the whole of this place and the Prime Minister's judgment have been mired in the mess. The Prime Minister must know all's not well, feeling the need to say to the world that our parliament, our politics are not corrupt. But allegations day after day do lap at the edges. Faith, if lost, is hard to restore. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel has told President Putin that Russia must stop what she called the inhumane exploitation of the migrant crisis on the border between Poland and Belarus. Thousands of people have massed in the area wanting to cross into Poland and then to enter the European Union. Uh, Poland's Prime Minister has accused Belarus of state terrorism in its handling of the crisis. Our Europe correspondent Nick Beek sent this report. For those who'd hoped to find a new life safe in the European Union, there's a grim realisation this could now be home, trapped between Belarus and Poland. The BBC was sent these pictures as journalists and crucially aid agencies are being kept away. It's a very, very bad. We managed to contact Ilias, who was a scientist in Iraq. He wants EU member Poland to let them through. My message is, I want to uh, open the border, the border uh, European, uh, Poland. Why should Poland open the border to you? One day, two day, three day. After, I died. You fear that people will die? Yes. Poland has been accused of pushing back migrants illegally. But it wants to highlight this. Belarusian troops appearing to force migrants along the border. The Polish accusing Belarus of terrorism, masterminded by Russia. And tonight, Angela Merkel appealed directly to Moscow. You are all following these disturbing images. I had Russian President Vladimir Putin on the phone today and I asked him to take action with President Lukashenko because people are being used here. But Russia has hit back, claiming the EU is provoking Belarus. Moscow released this footage, which it said showed two bombers being sent to patrol its allies' airspace in a show of solidarity and strength as international tensions rise from this border chaos. This huge forest called Białowieża is one of Europe's oldest woodlands, but it's now the epicenter of the continent's newest migrant crisis. Thousands have been trying to make their way from Belarus through these trees to here in Poland, and many more are set to follow, determined to take their chances in this wilderness if it means reaching EU soil. Because in Belarus's capital, Minsk, more families are preparing to head to the border after being welcomed by President Lukashenko's regime. Undeterred by the spiralling misery tonight in the makeshift camps that soon awaits them. Nick Beek, BBC News, on the Poland-Belarus border. Now, from uh, midnight tonight, anyone working in a care home in England will have to be fully vaccinated against COVID unless they have a medical exemption. Uh, care home managers in England, already struggling uh, with staff shortages, fear that they could eventually lose many workers as a direct result of the vaccination rule. The Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, says the uh, new arrangement will make uh, care homes much safer. Our social affairs editor, Alison Holt, has more details. The end of a breakfast shift for Daniela Bell and the end of a job that she loved. She's worked in a care home with people with dementia for nearly four years. But because she won't have the COVID jab, she had to leave before tonight's deadline. She's worried about potential vaccine side effects. It was difficult this morning. It was a bit heartbreaking because I love what I do and I love the people, I love the staff. Um, um, and it's been hard to break from that because that's what I, I can't see myself do any, something else. And the number of staff leaving remains a real worry, according to the National Care Forum, which represents services employing 14,000 people looking after 11,000 residents. 
In a snapshot survey, its members believe they will have lost 3.5% of their workers by midnight tonight, and another group will leave when they can no longer self-certify that they have a medical exemption. In these services alone, that adds up to more than a thousand staff going. Care homes feel that they've been guinea pigs in, in terms of the implementation of this policy. It means that the workforce that we need to be able to take in new people who require care, particularly whether they're coming from hospitals or the, from the communities, are just not there. Oh yeah, you've got another edge there. At this Croydon nursing home, they expect to lose three staff before Christmas when self-certified medical exemptions end. I think I had done it. Here, like many places in the care sector, they struggle to find nurses. There just aren't the nurses out there or the nurses that want to come and work in care homes. Uh, we've interviewed several nurses and when we've asked them the question, are they vaccinated, they've said no. Um, they, don't, they, they don't want to be vaccinated. It's just because of the way the immune system works. But information sessions run with their local council and NHS have persuaded most of their staff to have jabs. Some had been put off by what they read on social media. I think the information is the key. Um, I think that people shouldn't um, just busy themselves of what happened in social media because 90% of what they write there or what they say there uh, is lies. What did you think when you had it? Were you nervous? Well, when I was going there, I was a bit worried. But when I went there, they talked to me about the vaccine. So I had it and there was nothing. Compulsory vaccination is there to protect residents and staff after so many care home deaths during the pandemic. And despite existing staff shortages, council bosses believe homes will cope with support. Many of them have been recruiting, of course, to replace staff that they've known will be, will be leaving. So can't rule out there won't be a problem in a small number of places. But overall, this has been well managed and the sector will come through it. But whether homes will be able to find enough new staff to replace those who are going is still uncertain. Alison Holt, BBC News. So let's have a look at the uh, latest official figures for the pandemic in the UK. And they show that there were almost 40,000 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, which means that on average there were 33,866 new cases reported every day in the last week. 214 deaths were recorded of people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID test. On average, therefore, in the past week, 165 related deaths were recorded every day. And more than 10.9 million people have now received their booster jab. The Duchess of Sussex has apologised for misleading a court about information given by her aides to the authors of a biography. Megan sued the publisher of the Mail on Sunday over five articles. In her witness statement published today, she apologised and said that she did not intend to mislead the court about the role of one of her aides in providing information to the authors of the unauthorised biography. For the past seven years, South Africa has suffered drought and water shortages, uh, much of which is being blamed on climate change. In 2017, the city of Cape Town came very close to becoming the first major city in the world to run out of water. Our Africa correspondent, Andrew Harding, reports now on the unusual methods being deployed to save as much water as possible. High in the mountains around Cape Town, a bold and frantic fight to save rainwater. Teams here are scaling the wilderness to remove alien trees, armies of foreign invaders like the pine. That's because pine trees are thirsty, sucking up a quarter of the water that might otherwise end up in Cape Town's reservoirs. Every stump here means more water for humans. And these days, Africa's big, growing cities need every raindrop. Girls in a makeshift settlement near Cape Town gather at a communal tap. Drought, the calling card of climate change, has become part of their childhood. It's not something that will happen in the future, it's something that is happening right now. So it makes me worried, frustrated. It, it makes me want to take stand and bring up change. It's three years now since Cape Town came terrifying close to running out of water completely. We were here then to report on the world's first big modern city 
to face that threat. Back then, a devastating drought turned the city's reservoirs into dust bowls. The good news is that it shocked the authorities and the public into taking drastic action to slash their water usage. The thought of running out of water as a city was quite tragic and, and very scary. So, and the city did quite well in, 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 in preaching the message of saving water and we halved our water use. But Cape Town's successes are the exception here in South Africa. Not far from the city, the worst drought in more than a century is in full fury. Man-made climate change blamed for these scenes in the Eastern Cape. In desperation, wild animals are coming to farms in search of food. But it's been seven years with almost no rainfall. Farmers here now trudge across their bone-dry pasture land and wonder if the game is up. Sometimes uh, I don't want to think about the future. If you see our animals now, I'm not thinking about tomorrow. I'm just struggling and, and see how can I survive today. And in the towns and even cities here, the mood is not much cheerier. Frantic scenes when a charity brings a water truck to a settlement where the taps have been dry for months. But there is more to this than drought. It is easy and very tempting to blame the drought for the desperate conditions facing these families. But the truth is that this is about a failure of planning, of maintaining the infrastructure here. It's about a lack of investment. Across this region, some 40% of water reserves are being lost to leaking pipes. That's down to mismanagement and corruption. I'm worried about the future. Why do you think it's going to get worse? Because they don't look after us. The government? Yeah, they don't look after us. This is now a continent's challenge, to manage water better and to manage it more fairly because the droughts are queuing up, ominously, and there is no time to spare. Andrew Harding, BBC News, South Africa. A woman has been arrested following a dog attack in which a 10-year-old boy died. The 28-year-old from Kerfili in South Wales was questioned on suspicion of being in charge of a dog dangerously out of control, causing injury resulting in death. She was released on bail. Marks & Spencer reported a surge in half-year profits as its food division helped it bounce back after the Covid restrictions. Pre-tax profits for the six months to October were £187 million. That's up by almost 18% on the period two years ago before the pandemic. English cricketers have been eliminated from the T20 World Cup, losing to New Zealand in their semi-final in Abu Dhabi. England's hopes of reaching the final were ended when New Zealand reached their target of 167 runs with six balls to spare. Tomorrow is Armistice Day, the 11th of November, when people around the globe remember those lost in two world wars. In some cases, families are still demanding answers about the relatives that they lost. One of the worst maritime disasters in British waters involved the sinking of the aircraft carrier HMS Dasher off the Ayrshire coast back in 1943. Hundreds of lives were lost, and many believe the bodies were washed ashore and then buried in unmarked mass graves. Uh, Hugh Pym has been talking to one woman who spent decades searching for the truth. I want to honour him and I want to honour the others. It's been a long journey for Mary, but it's not over. She's determined to find out what happened to her father and other men who were lost at sea in World War II, not far from this beach in North Ayrshire. She thinks the truth has been withheld. The thought of my father, of other men being totally forgotten, being deliberately hidden, is so wicked that I just must put it right. HMS Dasher, an aircraft carrier, sank in minutes in the Firth of Clyde after an explosion on board, thought to have been caused by a petrol leak. 
Mary's father, George, was one of 379 men who died out of a total of more than 500 on board. I remember the telegram coming and my mother opened it and screamed. Barry, who's 96, remembers the day Dasher went down. Well, I was walking back from the bus and the next time I looked back, there was just the flames, smoke, because this, everyone seemed to have been told, no, don't talk about it. And even the survivors. There are just 23 known graves of those who perished on HMS Dasher and whose bodies were washed ashore, including some here in our Drossen Cemetery. But it remains a mystery what happened to others. Look at that. Two local residents, John and Noreen Steele, have spent the last few decades trying to find out. They've interviewed survivors and eyewitnesses who said there were more bodies than officially recorded. The survivors told us they were taken down to the mortuary to try and recognise them. They said there's about 50 bodies laid out for them. What do you think happened to them? They're in a pit somewhere. In a pit. Just dumped. A Royal Navy spokesperson said the creation of a mass unmarked grave would have gone against official policy on the burial of wartime casualties. It's been suggested that for morale reasons, news of the sinking was suppressed and wasn't confirmed until 1945. Documents released in recent years here at the National Archives at Kew shed some light on the loss of HMS Dasher. Officials did not want to reveal details to relatives. The papers refer to bodies being washed ashore more than a week after the loss of the ship. A former head of the Royal Navy thinks the whole truth has yet to come out. That a large ship like that with a very large ship's company should sink in enclosed waters, relatively enclosed, close to land, that there should be so few bodies that were actually buried um, together. I have real concerns that we haven't seen the full truth about what happened to those bodies. For Mary, the search for answers continues. She hopes to one day find out where her father's final resting place is. Hugh Pym, BBC News, North Ayrshire. There'll be special coverage of uh, tomorrow's Armistice Day events and the national silence at 11am on the BBC News channel. But now on BBC One, it's time to join our news teams where you are. Have a good night.